I've, I've got lots of thoughts running through my mind right now. All I'm asking to do, all I'm asking the judges to do, and everybody else associated with the system, come to the table. What we may find is what we're doing is right. There's nothing we can do about it. What we may find is we can make some minor changes. What we may find is um, there's more unity than there is division. But I think everyone would agree that the global imbalance right now that's happening around the world. You see, even with technology, we need human intelligence. In other words, we need you. If we have a bad apple, we're going to get rid of that bad apple. There's bad apples in every profession. So all that comes flooding back to me. I am so very sorry. Judges and prosecutors alike should be perpetually accountable through objective evaluation, or at least an evaluation period, where they must explain their decision-making processes, especially for violent felons. Especially for violent felons. Prosecutors and judges, even unelected ones, have absolute immunity, which means they cannot be held personally liable for their actions. We can and should do better. And that's, that's the unfortunate experience of experiencing evil. Someone knows who this individual is. No one will ever know. No one will ever know. Doug, why is the profession in its lowest place that you've ever seen? What tells you that? I think um, the, the, no matter what we do, we're wrong. And we're guilty until we prove ourselves innocent. And guys like me should be the ones held accountable for inappropriate actions by the rank and file. And I make, it, I make every single attempt to do that and be as transparent as I can. We are human beings. We're not machines. We have, we have families and kids and struggles and challenges and all the things that everybody else has, but yet we're expected to be something other than human. Please be patient. Become our partners and communicate with us as often as you can. I welcome that criticism. I welcome that criticism. You're going to hear more in just a minute about what we know do not discount the voice that you'll hear. I think all of us feel comfortable in our own skin, generally speaking. We don't want to accept criticism. Um, we don't want anybody to ask us ask why. We don't want anybody to say, have you thought about doing something different? I know people get frustrated about us being tight-lipped and not sharing information, but... Um... All the while, we're beaten and spit on and stabbed and killed. Um, Who's next? If it's not the right person, they'll just be out a little bit of time and they'll be cleared and they can go on and they'll never know that you called. But you may tell us who the right person was and you could be the person that helps us to solve this horrible crime. That, that rattled me a bit. So there's, there are issues that have, to be, that have to be addressed associated with the number of, 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 of people, staff, dealing with this, the, this law enforcement criminal justice crisis that we're facing today. We all know that they're understaffed. That's not a surprise. And the likely root cause of a coagulated and backed up system that could lead to the outcomes we're facing today. Number three, acknowledge that without accountability, our, our, our system of justice, both internally and externally, will irrevocably change. This isn't somebody else's problem, it's our problem. In other words, if you like it the way it is, leave it alone. Leave it alone. If you don't, we should engage it like never before. Number four, Check egos at the door. Politics, past events or circumstances, or whatever else is all yesterday's news. We all should learn from our history, our history, but we should not dwell on the past because our citizens deserve better.
This is not what the sheriff or the commissioners or the county council want. This is for the girls. This is for Abby and Libby. And so it's our effort to continue to move forward with trying to find justice for them. It's your city and mine. Even if you don't live here, it's the heartbeat of our state. I look forward to the future and hope with all of my soul that we get really uncomfortable with each other in the coming days, weeks, months. I hope we get really uncomfortable with each other. Put politics aside, hate me, criticize me, whatever you would choose. We never can accept the way it is. Our citizens deserve better and we all know what has to happen. We all know what has to happen. And as I sunset in my career, I am not going to leave it as broken as I see it. And I will do everything within my power to participate and help along the way. Help us to capture the person responsible for these murders. To secure a valid warrant, an officer must seek out a detached magistrate or judge and establish probable cause supported by oath or affirmation. This is usually done through an application for a warrant whereby the facts and circumstances are laid out, and the officer signs an affidavit to accompany the application wherein the officer swears or affirms as to the factual basis of the statements in the application. The magistrate or judge who makes the determination regarding probable cause then considers all the statements in the application to determine whether probable cause exists. While warrants all need to conform to the Fourth Amendment's minimal requirements, standards regarding the form and content of a warrant are usually established by local law or court rules. The Fourth Amendment provides that the warrants must particularly describe the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Courts disfavor overbroad and general warrants inasmuch as these are the types of warrants that the framers intended to prohibit when drafting the Fourth Amendment. Although minor mistakes do not necessarily invalidate warrants, the descriptions of the places to be searched and the persons or things to be seized must be sufficient to leave nothing to the discretion of the officer executing the warrant. Probable cause. Probable cause, like search and seizure, is a phrase that is explicitly mentioned by the Fourth Amendment. Probable cause is the standard that must be met for any warrants to issue, and for any searches or seizures to be executed. There are two definitions of probable cause, the level of probable cause necessary for a search, and that is necessary for an arrest. Let's start with probable cause necessary to justify a search. Probable cause is determined based on the totality of the circumstances test, which means that the court will consider all the factors present and known to the officer at the time of the search or seizure. Probable cause to search exists when the facts and circumstances within the officer's knowledge, and of which they have reasonably trustworthy information, are sufficient in themselves to warrant a man of reasonable caution in the belief that an item subject to seizure will be found in the place to be searched. The search cannot be based on just a hunch. Evidence seized illegally by law enforcement may not be used against any state or federal criminal defendant. Moreover, once evidence is excluded, the fruit of the poisonous tree rule requires that all evidence that was obtained because of the illegally seized evidence is also inadmissible at trial. The fruit of the poisonous tree rule can sometimes mandate harsh or even incongruous results. Take, for example, the case of a police officer who illegally searches a person's trunk and finds cocaine. The officer arrests the driver, and while conducting a search incident to the arrest, finds an illegal handgun in his pocket that is later tied to a murder. He then gets a warrant and searches the driver's house, where he finds two dead bodies in the basement, a stash of child porn on his computer, and 12 kilograms of methamphetamine behind the peanut butter in the kitchen pantry. After being arrested, the suspect confesses to three murders, drug trafficking, running a child prostitution ring, and to being an all-around bad guy. All this evidence would be excluded under the fruit of the poisonous tree rule, including the confession, because none of this would have been obtained but for the illegal search of the trunk. It all grew from the poison tree of the initial illegal search. Unless the government can find other clean evidence, this really, really bad guy will walk. 
However, where the magistrate or judge in issuing a warrant was misled by information in an affidavit that the affiant knew was false, or would have known was false except for his reckless disregard for the truth, then suppression would be required. In this case, there is no true good faith. Moreover, the good faith exception applies only where the police held a supposedly valid warrant. If the police make a warrantless search under what they believe is an exception to the warrant requirement, or where police conduct a search that they honestly believe there is no warrant required for, there is no applicable exception, and the exclusionary rule must be applied.
After five frustrating years, this man, Richard Allen, was arrested for killing both girls. Allen admitted being in the area that day, and prosecutors say a bullet found at the scene was forensically connected to his gun. One problem, Abby and Libby were not shot. And now we're learning a lot more about the murders through documents filed in court by Allen's attorneys. Information that the defense suggests shows ritualistic killings connected to Odinism, an ancient Nordic religion allegedly followed by some local white nationalists. But let's remind you, this crime scene, absolutely brutal. Brutal. If you're a family member, one of the parents, grandparents, loved ones of these two girls, you have to be absolutely horrified about what has now become publicly revealed and is part of this case. Sources close to the investigation have provided me with drawings of what they say those images look like, the, the arrangement of those sticks. So let's start with the one of Abby, and it shows three sticks. Now, we have not placed her body here because this is how it was provided to me. We don't know exactly what the positioning on top of her was like, but this is supposed to be a representation of what the image looked like the way the sticks were formed. Um, now let's put up the image from Libby. And there's five sticks involved here by my count. And you can look at these and decide if they look like something to you or look like they're randomly placed. Uh, I have spoken to many investigators who were on the scene at the time who say, the assumption was they were randomly placed. They did not see a pattern. They didn't see intentionality there. The other interesting thing about these sticks, they did not collect them when they collected evidence from the crime scene. Whoa, 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 whoa. slow down. They sticks are placed on the bodies yes. of the two victims here, and they're not collected as evidence? They were not collected as evidence until several weeks later conceivably when this Odinism stuff started to arise within the investigation, and they went back to try to collect those sticks. Um, we do have a little more information than what the public does. Um, most of what they have told us, uh, they've asked us not to share, it, and not a lot, not mm -hmm. a lot more. You know, we got to hear a little more of the video than what they have out there. Um, but what we heard isn't going to help the case anymore. Um, in a way, I don't want to know some of that, only because I talk. <laughs> <laughs> so let's keep going and going and going. <laughs> I talk. And I don't want to accidentally say something that could jeopardize the case. So do I want to know more than I want to protect the case? No, I won't, I won't do that. I'll stay in the dark. Here's what we ask people. Share, share, share. Um, we can only assume that we haven't reached the right person yet. Either it's somebody covering up or we haven't reached the person that recognizes that picture. But did, did you have suspicions right away? Did somebody come to your mind? No. But did, did you have suspicions right away? Did somebody come to your mind? No. We will work to dispel rumors and false information. We cannot let this threat define us. But we know that our response all of our responses will. But I'm good with it. I'm good with, I'm good with those questions. Ask them. Ask them. We have nothing to hide and we'll do the very best we can to do the right thing. Let this be our finest hour and I think it will. Right now in Delphi, the FBI is putting together a suspect profile to help identify the killer of those two girls you just saw. They hope that profile will help police bring Libby German and Abby Williams' killer 
to justice. This is all new and exclusive information that we're bringing to you right now. We just talked with the superintendent, Doug Carter of Indiana State Police. He tells us he's confident they're getting much closer to finding Abby and Libby's killer and investigators are still working around the clock tonight, but we just learned from the superintendent that they have recovered a very important piece of evidence from the crime scene that is linked to the killer. That's the first time we're hearing any of the information about what was found at the crime scene. And also this is an active and ongoing investigation, but with that key evidence and a suspect profile, police tell us they're getting closer every day to that killer and they want him to know that. Right now, they're still going after him with the mindset that he could very well be a local. Now, the FBI profile that is in the works right now will give police a better idea of who exactly they are looking for because they do have that voice and they do have that grainy photo. But this looks at behavioral aspects of that person. So behavioral analysts from the FBI can identify certain personality traits, behavioral traits and lifestyle things that the suspect would have all of that information then gives police clues to what kind of things they can be looking for when they're serving those search warrants here in Carroll County and around central Indiana. Uh, I know that we have the human element. We have a very solid science element. Right We're now. using every capable process that we have from a scientific perspective as everyone would expect us to and we will continue to do that till there's nothing left to do. Would that include DNA? It does. Okay. Was DNA found at the scene? It, it includes DNA um, and I think that's an indication, albeit an unintentional one, of how history continues to define who we are as a profession and as an agency and as people that are bound and determined to answer questions to you to eventually eventually bring the people that did this um, to hand I, I, and, and um, I, it certainly would be my hope that that eventually we will technology has come a long ways since 1978 the way in which we communicate has come a long way since 1978. Our relationships um, are, are different. Our approach is different. And um, it, again, um, this can't be a 43 minute resolution like it is on television. But um, it's certainly, uh, we can send the message that we're not going to stop. I don't believe in cold cases necessarily, um, particularly when we still have to continually have things to do. And, and we do, for their for their their, their resolute ability and, and desire to continue to perpetuate this after all these years, and I'll close with saying to, to each of you, thank you. Um, I, I know I'm going to get some questions on Flora and Delphi, and um, uh, that they continue to rock my soul to this day. Uh, I was 17 years old when this when this 16 years old when this case happened in 1978. So I, I, I have at least an understanding, uh, certainly empathy for the family that survives, and my commitment to them is longstanding and real as it is uh, up in Carroll County. This is just my, my opinion based on a simple mind, but this case is going to be solved because of you. I, I, I would crawl with, um, on my hands and knees to help Bill Dalton or Chuck Cohen, Speedway, wherever that might be, but 40 years. We communicate differently. I appreciate the question. We communicate differently now than we ever have before and likely better than we ever have before. And uh, the, the, the notion that there's a secret out there is only good if one person is no longer with us. So somebody that knows something about this is going to watch what you all do today. That, there's no doubt in my mind about that. And I was sitting listening to, to Bill explain the, the notion of this knife. And I'm, I'm going back in my mind to those days in the, in the late 1970s and if I'm thinking about an individual or a person, all of a sudden, my gosh, that's right. That person actually had a sheath that he, would, he or she would always wear on their belt. I never thought it was them, but man, oh man, that, that triggers some thoughts from, from those days. That's what we owe to this family. That's what we owe to this family. If the murderer is deceased, fine. If the murderer is not deceased, then if you're, if you're carrying that burden, you have to come forward. You have to come forward and talk about it. Imagine the relief that will, 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 will be taken away from you. So this is um, um, likely going to be solved through technology and science, but most importantly is human intelligence. And uh, that human intelligence comes from what you're doing for us today. So I, again, you've heard me, all say, you've heard me say this to you all before, but I, 
I really, truly do appreciate the time because I know there's a lot happening around Indianapolis and up in Hamilton County today. But for you guys to be here is a really big deal. And I, I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> I got to tell you, I'm a little bit nervous. This is live. As I stand here before you, I just cannot help to, to now what can be desolation, lack of interaction, struggles, funerals, and just general instability. I think we've all felt that, but probably not back to a replica of our prior life for a long, long time. Excuse me. From my view as an agency, I could not be more proud. As I said early on, there's, there was no playbook. But we have one now. And we all did the very, very best that we could. Then you could not provide the service to our citizens that you do. Unusually low compared with other large agencies. Yesterday, we had only two people. While calls for service were down, Significant events continued to occur, and you were always there. Very capable and highly effective agency during times of crisis. And we've sure had our share. Now, let me explain to you why I'm standing in this empty auditorium in the Indiana Government Center South of American law enforcement. George Floyd, George Floyd's death at the hands of those police officers on that dreadful day has left an indelible mark in not only our profession, but more importantly, on all of our citizens, no matter what their zip code is, what color they are, what their, what's their culture, what's their belief system, or what is their perception of our service to them. I really wish over time I would have cataloged and documented, but since I did not, like many of you, we will carry the memories with us forever. And from a global perspective, how did it affect American law enforcement? Please allow me to be vulnerable for a minute. I have missed many opportunities this last year to properly communicate with all of you. To address events that have occurred around the country in real time and even right here at home that have affected all of us individually and everybody that you represent. All of these examples should have been a clear sign to me. But I missed it. I will not stand here and offer excuses. You deserve better than that. But I will stand here wishing I had a redo and to acknowledge to each of you that I am sorry I missed those many opportunities, that I will regret because of the many misses that I had. Man, hindsight's 2020. The Indianapolis racial, racial justice protests that turned into riots on the heels of George Floyd's death are etched in my mind forever. I vividly remember standing on the east side of the Capitol with our TIF squads. That night, the smell of tear gas, fires, burning tires, and even gunshots filled the air in our city. We were being pelted with rocks, with bricks, with frozen water bottles, what we believe to have been urine filled canisters and nearly anything that could be launched at us. Every one of you matter to me. But our black, brown and female troopers was disgusting. I was so proud of all of you. Unfortunately, many of them were not surprised by the way in which they were treated. The gathering soon became an opportunity 
for many in the audience to share how they have been spoken to and treated during their careers, both inside and outside of our agency. I will never forget one person saying to me, Superintendent, when was the last time you were ever in a room and no one looked like you? I was standing right in front of this podium when I was asked that question. Hearing the question and then answering never was and will always be a defining moment in my life. It helped me begin to begin to understand that I don't understand. That moment helped me to begin to understand that I don't understand would rock the conscience of most of you. Our words matter. Our words matter. I hope over these last many months that maybe a bit of reckoning has occurred. I know it has with me. I know it has with me. I also learned that day that I do see color. From a comment that was made to be in the back of this very room. I do see color. To show the magnitude and size of this challenge and the many opportunities that are before us is why I'm standing in this huge space. We cannot, we should not try to erase or marginalize or pretend that historical events did not occur. But we should learn from them. We should recognize them. We should never forget them. I wanted, I, I, I wanted to gain the perspective on what we actually face today. I was struck by the consistency of the division then compared to now. Are we going to let that happen? Everyone deserves better. Everyone deserves better, especially the, the, for especially those that don't look like me. Sadly, everybody, the stories were very similar. <clears throat> I do not and will not apologize for either of these gatherings. I was getting advice from many, many people. And I realized I just did not know what to do. But we must recognize the magnitude and reality of our divide. How welcoming, welcoming we are to each other. How do you deal with conflict with a person that doesn't look like you? Think like you. If you haven't noticed, our globe is out of balance. Our globe is out of balance. I've asked people all over this great state, what do I do? There's no dimmer. There's no on off switch. What do I do as a leader of this agency? The answer is no, but we are free. This will be a new position that will answer directly to me that you felt were inappropriate, uncomfortable or offensive that currently are required to go through a very formal process for any action to occur. And say, here's what happened. Remember what I said earlier, many of these situations were not intentional. I've heard from many of you, kind of weird for us because it's outside of a formal structure. But let's try this. Let's be a little bit different. It's my belief and desire that by creating a position like this, 
that reports directly to me and explain the why and how we are currently functioning. Another miss on my behalf. I didn't think that our numbers would be near what they are in totality. But I know we can always do more. I've said this so many times. I saw a car, I have a relationship, it was at church, it was my friend's dad or my mom or my friend's mom or whoever it might be. Mobility and planning for all. I'm looking forward to these processes. A lot has happened in these eight plus years. Some you agree with, some you don't. But I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not one and I'll never be a, 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 a guy that will say, because we've always done it that way, we're not gonna change. We found ourselves at a crossroads. We have to address these issues head on. And that's exactly what we'll do. My focus will be on sustainability, succession planning, operational mobility, and working tirelessly to take care of our most important asset, and that is you. It's my job to take care of you. And of course, share with you events, things, struggles, challenges that might be coming to us from an external perspective. In the meantime, I'm always available and do, and, and, and do anticipate getting to the field sometime in the next month, maybe a month and a half. I've got some work to do out there and I'm looking forward to that period of time. But when bad things are happening to good people, we come together. The true review of how we did during our time, during our time, doesn't come in an annual evaluation. Rather, it comes when you're all long gone. And in the grand scheme of things, I guess that's not necessarily a bad thing all in all. Because we should take some responsibility for the way in which the world is today with how people perceive us. I've talked about that for a long time. We cannot, we cannot miss this opportunity because if we do, history will not be good to us. Will not be good to us. I am committed to doing my part in the hopes that these many issues are not once again passed on to the next generation. The time is now to hold each other accountable. We are all bad people. and to not let lone, irresponsible, callous, and illegal action of some divide us or define us that we're all bad. I stand here alone, but as the symbolism that I understand the immense responsibilities that I willingly shoulder for the care of our profession. As we approach these impending crossroads, we all must recognize that we have found ourselves in the most consequential period of our time, the most consequential period of our time. How will we respond? How will you respond? Some have suggested that the best way through tough times is right up the middle. I could not agree more. I could not agree more. We didn't think there was any probability of success. We just didn't think we'd be standing here. But I also think everyone agree, agrees that, that this profession is at a crossroads. And we have got to look at the future of law enforcement training differently than we ever have before. Yes, yes, we, we, we do think change needs to, needs to occur here. And, and here in Indiana, we're going to invest in that. And I completely understands the dynamic associated with all that we see, all that we deal with, all that we do, all we're expected to be to what we can do in Indiana to be a model for this nation. 
and I'm confident, I'm confident that's what's going to happen over time. So, don't need to listen to me anymore. Um, when you think about where we started and where we arrived at, at the end of the day with a standing ovation, uh, quite a feat. And there were many that said it couldn't be done, but we proved here in the state of Indiana that we can take on tall challenges uh, to make sure that the folks who are called to this profession are resourced appropriately, have access to the training and to the equipment that they need. And to think about how we got here, a lot of people to think, you see some standing here. In a time when a lot of people, quite frankly, were saying, are you biting off more than you can chew? Are you going somewhere where this is high stakes, it may not materialize? To be able to fine tune and adjust along the way, every step of the way, who was able to, at the moment we needed it most, bring in diverse communities and perspectives and be able to advance to again arriving at this day where I just simply couldn't be prouder of along the way. This is, this is another example of Indiana setting the standard. A lot of other states looking to Indiana asking how did you do this during a time like that. And we know it's a part of what we do. It's a part of this world in which we live. It's been proliferated uh, uh, to almost every community on the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And the responsible thing for us to do is to say, you know what? And there's, a, there's already some rumor out there that it's, take, it's, it's, it's an overreach of government and all those kinds of things. Yeah. And believe it, moms and dads, they're watching you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely they are. And they think it's okay. They do. You know, and, and there's all kinds of science-based uh, science -based research out there that suggests it's equal to a certain percentage or level of, of, of a blood alcohol mm -hmm. content. Well, isn't it amazing how we've m morphed over time? Um, right. yeah. We did a lot of work, all law enforcement agencies did a lot of work with trying to change the culture. Mm -hmm. We know what happened there. It wasn't popular at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, um, and we know what happened. Yeah. yeah, And there's a lot of families out there still intact because of that. Right. I see this as the same, it's, just, it's the same thing over time. Um, and I don't think anybody could close their eyes and say, yeah, we need to do this yeah. and, and, and not disagree with it. Right. Um, that's a very bold move. And again, I know there are going to be people, some people that disagree with it because I know there's so many people not paying attention, uh -huh. not by design. I'm going to wrap myself out here very yeah. publicly. Oh. You know, they're not like the intent. They went into a bank with a pistol and robbed a bank. Right, right. So everybody should think about what would that consequence mean to me? If that was me, what would it mean? And, and like I said at the start of this, I'm guilty. Yeah. And I think about that. Well, I, I, I'm not sure how I could put a foot in front of the other. No. A group. Mine well, doesn't matter. It goes no. so far. Right. And so, again, right. uh, important, uh, kind of uh, unprecedented for the Indiana State Police to... to s oh, my gosh. We, we heard you. Yeah. Because there's guys and gals all over Indiana that are pushing this information to us. You know, and the, and the other thing I think is important, John, is that parents recognize scary yeah. It's scary. So, yeah. you know, tell them, I'm going to work at this too. Yeah. And so you talk about unintended consequence and how you how you put one foot in front of the other. Um, but as part of his, not so much his penance also, but for his own mental stability, he's coming out and, and talking about those things. And he, he says, every day I wake up and every day I go to bed, every minute, at least in between, I think to myself. But we can kill just like anybody else mm -hmm. can. We are not supermen mm -hmm. and super ladies. Exactly. And 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 we found out, you know what? That why why do they right. need to be exempt? Yeah. You know? We die like everybody else. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Mm -hmm. That's still that's still very early to say what the what the actual outcome is going to be. There has to be something to it. Yeah. Um, but I, it would be my suggestion that we hold off, you know, five or six months and let folks understand this is yeah. coming. Good morning. Good morning, sir. What was your score yesterday? Sorry, to do, sir. What about your roommate? Sir, Parker's was a 96, sir. Okay, do you feel comfortable? Sir, uh, yes, sir. A little bit more to do, but you're grasping it. Sir, yes, sir, I have to ask okay. you, sir. Okay, okay. Congratulations, you worked very hard. Sir, thank Proud you. Proud of you. You've been through two-on-one -on -one in this very room. The thing that, and, and all those skills are all very, very important, that we continue to deal with crisis and problems. Problems and problems, and then a crisis and problems.
every single time they do this as a unit, it gets a little bit better. And each time, I don't think it could get better, but it does. And your testament to that was a really, really big deal. So I hope you're starting to understand now a little bit about why we're different, why we do the things that we do, and um, it's worth the ride. It's worth the ride. As hard as it is, it's worth the ride. So again, I'm, I'm proud of you. You, you came into this today um, and you look really, really good. And I look forward to watching you over the course of the next, next several months. I'm most, most grateful to them for their willingness to step up and step out. It's very clear that if there's not this level of accountability in our society with outreach, those, the possibility of what could come, we're going to continue to perpetuate this model of violence that's, per, that's permeated our entire society. These are the steps that have to be taken to, to bring us back to some level of civilization because this level of violence that we're all seeing is just not okay. So there was never a doubt in my mind um, where he would land if, on this particular matter if he could. And he's always been one to do things that, that, that he should, not that he can. I, I don't understand where we've lost the value of human life. I, I don't understand where that's happened. And um, we can talk about all the different issues associated with the way in which we exist today, whether it be socioeconomically, whether it be uh, the violence in a particular neighborhood, it could be about the lack of hope, the lack of jobs, lack of resources, whatever that might be. But I think everyone understands the only thing that lasts forever is dying. And we've lost that ability to, to, to rationalize that. Uh, we're going to have to continue to respond to this and not let it ever be okay to us. Just another day. It can't be another day. It just, it just can't be another day. We've got real problems and, and it's this kind of a response, these kinds of families, this kind of a community that will, that will maybe send a, send a message because this is all about accountability. We're going to continue to see this and we're not, never going to be able to stop it. But we, there better be at least a fear of, a, of, of accountability. So I, we, we don't know. The future is going to be able to, to, to the future will tell us. Um, but we have limitations now with what we can do with individuals that... Every single time it's like the first time to be in this environment. Some will say, why would you ever want to do that? Why would you, why would you want to do it now? It's a really big deal. So I don't want anyone in here to think that we would ever do anything that would cause them harm in a world that is really, really, really out of balance. I hope they make their beds in the morning at home. If they don't, let me know. You know, we're all problem solvers and many type A personalities that, 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 that live in this space. The things that I've seen bad over the course of 11 years, I, don't, I can't even count. But what I can say is when things are bad, there's not a better agency on the planet Earth. And it's amazing, it's amazing what our culture allows us to do for others, not for ourselves. For others, not for ourselves. There's something about the stability of this uniform. As you remember this night, and you kind of wonder what the heck's happening as you get out there, and you wonder why maybe our uniform can't change, or why we can't expose tattoos or beards or whatever that might be. I hope you remember the word stability, because our service is not about us. It's about how we represent seven million people. One more thing that I would be remiss to not talk about uh, while I have the attention of so many people that care so deeply. And it's about time. It's about time. And he said, law enforcement is not without sin. The magnitude of those words, recognizing that we're human, recognizing that we should continue to evaluate and review and perpetually evaluate all we are as an individual, all we do as, a, as a, a provider of service, how we interact with our communities, no matter the color of their skin, no matter who they love, no matter what they do. 
and we kind of lost our way over time. It's a pleasure for me to, to be able to stand in front of hundreds of people, sometimes thousands, and say those very words. And I say that to you because I want you to understand we're vulnerable. What you've raised and who you love are human beings, are human beings. And if a person ever does what they know is wrong when they do it, shame on them. But if they make a mistake based on doing their very, very best, welcome them. Bring them in. Protect them. That's my commitment to you until my final days. Bring them in. And that's exactly what will happen. Anecdotally, one quick example. If you've never been in a physical altercation or a fight for your life, don't pretend to know. Don't pretend to have the answer on how law enforcement should have responded unless you've been there. The person that should be held accountable for those kinds of issues and incidents is me and people that sit in similar chairs to me. I should be the one held accountable for holding them accountable and that's what you should expect. That's what you should expect. These are amazing people. Amazing people. And you can get through almost anything that this complicated, screwed up world might offer. It's got great big buttons on it. Get out of here. <laughs> Law enforcement leaders around this country must acknowledge that fact and talk about it. And I will continue to be the voice of that until my final day. Racial bias, our inability to accept or understand different cultures, along with, so, with societal imbalances, have immensely affected our way of life. And that includes all of us. Because they know what happens here happens there. Now is our time. Now is our time and we must acknowledge our system is not working. The position that we have found ourselves in has happened over time. Our time is now to get really uncomfortable with each other. To take full responsibility for all of our citizens and for all of our actions. Not just one part of the system, but everybody involved in the system. We must evaluate what we do, why we do it, and then be transparent with very objective results. We must establish criteria for evaluation and then unapologetically accept it. We must not live within a shadow of accountability. Rather, we must embrace a structure where we encourage and publicly discuss accountability just like you expect from us. But it's been, it's been indicated that, that I have over time. And maybe even could be a deterrent from a crime being committed in the first place. Bad guys and gals aren't afraid of this system. In our system of justice, but more importantly, do they feel safe? And if not, why? I think it'd be antithetical to do anything else. We should ask them that very, very question. And I think we all probably know the outcome. And I suspect that it will rock our conscience. Because more than 95% of the citizens and the people they interact with like them, appreciate them, 
And, and it, would, it would be a shining example, not just to other cities and, and areas within Indiana, but I think it would, be, it, would be, it would be viewed as a very progressive step by those contiguous states that are around us. When they continually chase that same individual, you know, the, the Gun Crimes Task Force is something we could spend a lot of time on. But that goes, th th those guys and gals, and we are participants in that, go after the worst of the worst people. Why? Because they're the ones creating fear in our communities. Well, what, what I'll tell you is, in large part, the number of, of increase in police action shootings is because of someone else's action, someone else's behavior. So I think we need to be, we need to be careful here. And we need to talk about what we know, not what we think. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about that uh, over, the, over time. Um, but again, um, I'm talking about people who commit violent crimes against people like you and your families. I welcome that criticism. I welcome that criticism. I'd go anywhere with them. I'd go anywhere with them and do all I can do to support them. So anyway, um, we are a piece of the puzzle. We're not the entire puzzle. And none of this will happen with successfully without your involvement, every single one of you in this room. None of it will happen. What do we do about the perception that's reality to people? Do you feel comfortable here at 2 in the morning? You've answered my question. Most don't. And I hate to say that. I hate to say that. I hate to say that. But it's just the reality of today. Can we fix that? You know, I live in this world that I really believe in people. I believe that, that there are consequences for actions. I believe that if, if, if people come together to try and make a positive outcome, they can do it, whether it's on a Little League team or, or running, uh, a, a, run, running the state police or holding any elected office. It doesn't matter. If we accept it the way it is, we own it. If you want to give this to your kids the way it is, great. I don't. I, I don't. I've, I've got lots of thoughts running through my mind right now. There is nowhere to hide. There is nowhere to hide the amount of violence that happens to good citizens of this state should rock the very soul of who we are. We need the community to talk to us. Are you ready, sir? Uh, we'll start with uh, giving out the certificates, but before we do, I just want to say real quick, this class by far, we talk about it at least once a week, is the most uh, hardworking, dedicated um, class that we've ever had. Um, we were all sweating a little bit, but um, I'd say that's the fun part of it. and with you all. When no one else is around and no one else is coming to you, especially for those of you that are going to rural Indiana. We have dark days ahead in this country and we must, we must stay strong. We must not turn our citizens off, turn our citizens against us because of criticism, because some of that criticism we we have earned, and we own it. We have to take this opportunity, and we have to run with it like never, ever before. I have work to do internally within the ISP, and I take that very, very seriously, and will not tolerate disrespect towards each other, or rude or hurtful comments to each other. Please understand the value of your word, ladies and gentlemen. If you have to tell somebody you're sorry for something you did or something you said, make it right. Don't let it linger. Why you must decide what you want from cops. I don't like the word, but that's how she wrote it. It's time for the American public to decide what we want from law enforcement. Warriors, counselors, guardians, Priest, 
social workers, and sometimes even magicians. Do we want the cheapest cops possible? Or do we want well-trained and well-screened who are equipped with every tool needed for every possible eventuality? Or do we want the beat cop from granddad's hometown with nothing but a smile, a wheel gun, and one set of cuffs? Really, we want it all. Admit it, we do. And we want it all without paying for any of it. Every officer needs to be an empathetic, well-spoken, SEAL-trained ninja with double majors in psychology, social work, who considers the job a calling. It has no bills to pay, no nerves to fray, and enforces the law completely objectively while also using discretion at all times, unless it's going to result in arresting or not arresting. The wrong person at the wrong time for the wrong thing. Humans are fallible and their bodies are frail. Their brains play tricks on them when they're under stress and then keep them from sleeping by replaying the stressor on an endless loop later, trying to find ways to fix whatever went wrong. Humans come in varieties, not exactly like dog breeds. They find humor in ugly, dark places that just frighten the rest of society. They're not always nice. He'll never embarrass the chief at coffee with a cop. He'll present well on camera every time and remind you of someone's grandfather. They want the demon Melanois, 55 pounds of rawhide, spring steel, and gator teeth diving into gunfire and doing anything it takes, anything to keep children safe. That's not how it works, and it's not fair. I tell you now the unicorn doesn't exist. You, you can't have it, just like you. Things no one can be, things none of you can be. The rest of society is also human after all. So if you, if, if you choose to make a bad decision, it will, it will not bode well. So please, please, please remember and look in the mirror what you represent now, not just, not just yourself. Does everybody understand that? Sir, yes, sir. Hello and welcome to the Indiana State Police Public Information Program. I'm your host today, Sergeant Dave Burston, Public Information Officer with the Indiana State Police at the Indianapolis Post. Now today we've got a very exciting program for you. We've got MC Axe and the Fire Crew. If you haven't heard of them before or seen their uh, presentation, you're in for a real treat. It was a personal friend of mine, Chief Phil Cowie from the Fishers, uh, Fishers Police Department. I almost uh, put you on the police again. That's the all Fishers right. Fire. We don't mind, Dave. I don't want to take any away from the show, so I'm going to let you start. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Dave. We have some music. we got some kids in here with us. Now we need you to clap together. We lift you up. We lift the clothes, kids, fire. We lift the clothes, kids, fire, and you don't know what to do. We lift the clothes, kids, fire, and you don't know what to do. What? Now swing under, and one more time, back around, now take a bow, perfect, when you think that fire is a very fun thing to play, when you think that fire is a very fun thing to play, but don't mess around cause it'll burn you up someday, now if you're close, can't don't run, don't scream, don't cry. But if the clothes get fired, don't run, don't scream, don't cry. Wow, she was great. You know, I think she's done that before. What an excellent dancer. We call him Pickhead. How's it going? Well, Pickhead. Actually, his name's Mark. But let's have a big hand for Pickhead. How's it going? Well, what does that mean? Well, that tells you what to do if your clothes ever caught on fire. You know, if you get too close to something that's hot, like a fireplace or maybe a stove or something like that, and you get your, your sleeve or your pants too close to that, they can catch on fire. And if they do, you're going to get hurt. And let's see if we can get somebody from our audience. How about our little dancer? She was really good. Let's get our little dancer back out here and show how we do that now. And it's a little bit different. All right, well, let's see if we can make a little shift here. Is that better? 
All right, do I look like I'm ready for a hoedown? Are y'all ready for a hoedown with me? You're getting kind of bored. You're going to lose your gourd. And you're wondering how you'll ever fill the time. Now what you going to do? Keep from getting blue. Well, there's one thing that should never cross your mind. Don't play with fire. Don't ever play with fire. I just don't think you understand. That if you play with fire, with any kind of fire, you might not play with any again. Ooh. Or dress up with your favorite Barbie doll. <laughs> Or play with G.I. Joe Or with your brother's toe But there's one thing you should never do at all Now you can climb a tree And maybe skin your knee Or wrestle on the floor with Ben Or maybe fly a kite Or stay up late at night But there's one rule that I'll tell you all again Don't play with fire Don't ever play with fire If you play with fire with any kind of fire, you might not play with anything again. Let's get a clap along. Here we go. Don't play with fire. Don't ever play with fire. I just don't think you understand that if you play with fire, with any kind of fire, you might not play with anything again. Does your mom have a knife or a pair of scissors at home? Yeah. That's right. Now, toys are things like Barbie dolls and G.I. Joes and Matchbox cars and, and bicycles. Those are fun to play with, aren't they? I got a train set. Because they don't hurt. You what? I got a train set. You got a train set? Yeah, I got a train set. Sure, sure. All right, sure. the next thing we want to teach sure. you is about smoke. Now, we can teach you something that will help learn about that. Smoke goes up. You want to get down and go. Sure you do. The baby says, if you ain't yet asleep, we're well, it's a sin. You're lying there alone, and she's yakking on the phone, a fire begins. Smoke is gonna rise, and you don't want it in your eyes. Get low, get down and go. Oh, yeah. Hey, you wanna dance again? All right, come on out. Here we go. For the door, grab that baby sitter now and you pull her to the floor. She don't know what to do, and well, she's just about to freak. So you look her right straight in the eye and see the smoke. Bluey, Bluey, you're coming with me. Well, I checked my smoke detector just the other night, and I found it was not working, and it got me so uptight. I got the broke down smoke detector blue. I got the broke down smoke detector blue. Yeah. Don't want no sneaky fire sneaking up on me. No. I got the broke down smoke detector blue. Yeah. Now, what'd you do about it? Well, I got me a brand new battery. That's good. And I put it in its voice. Oh, yeah. Now, my smoke detector's working fine. There's a big smoke on my face. Won't be no sneaky fire sneaking up on me, no. But right now, what do you say? You ready and to do the song? It's night. a little different. I got, I got, we wait, call wait, it. Wait a minute. We got one more thank you to do. What? Well, we really want to thank Indiana State Police for having us on today. Well, yeah, that's a good idea. When something's smoking, you should be joking that it's hot, hot, hot. When flames are showing, you should be knowing that it's hot, hot, hot. When something's glowing, you should be knowing that it's hot, hot, hot. Well, you must resist coming close just like this. You'll be feeling the heat and the bone. Hot, hot, hot. You 
Jason. Ole. Ole. Here we go, all together. One, two, three. Two. Ole, 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 ole. Ole, 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 ole. Do that thing. Here we go. To the rim. Two, two, one, two, three. Two, three. Two, three. Two, Hey, I think we need some help. Flames in the kettle are hot, hot, hot. Stone in the kitchen is hot, hot, hot. Old space heater could be hot, hot, hot. Ashes in the fireplace are hot, hot, hot. Well, I'm hot. You're hot. Hot. She's hot. I'm hot. You're hot. They're hot. We're hot. Okay, here we go. Let's get some kids to come up and dance with us. Come on, the conga line. Here we go. One, two. Everybody conga. Kick your legs out. Underlay. You kids doing it at home? Oh, you guys was great. Okay, there you go. Go back to your seat. I think so. <laughs> well, I want to say a big thanks to MC Axe and the fire crew for out here and coming out. It's only $8, and if they need it shipped out, there's a very small shipping charge, but it's really it's a great tape. It's all just to cover costs. Uh-huh, okay. it's exactly right. Get that phone number costs. one more time. It's 317-595-200. Phil, thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. Glad to be here. Till next time, take care, be safe. Bye-bye.